Last week, my wife Chrissy took on the parables that Jesus taught of the banquet, which was to invite not the important people, but to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled while those who humble themselves will be exalted. That was the great welcoming table for all. And this week, I'll be focusing on gathering together from the book of Ephesians. In this book, Paul was writing to the churches of Ephesus, most likely sent to one church and then circulating around to probably six or seven churches in the region. Ephesus was a large port city. It was actually considered the gateway to Asia. It was in the present-day present Turkey, and it was just outside the city limits that you would find the Greek goddess temple of Artemis. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. And inside the city, you would also find a large Jewish community who had a synagogue. And then there was this new creation called the Way, which was a combination of people from the Greek temple of Artemis and the people from the Jewish synagogue. They were now Christians. The famous apostle Paul introduced Christianity to this region around 53 AD, and then he wrote this letter eight years later, it seems. Of all Paul's letters in the New Testament, Ephesians is a little bit different. See, all the other letters that Paul wrote seem to be like correcting or rebuking churches. This one took what seemed to be the high road. This was a totally different approach. Many biblical scholars see it to be the greatest piece of writing in all history. In fact, an English poet said, the most divine composition of man is the book of Ephesians. But what makes this book so special? Well, as I said, he's not correcting errors when Paul wrote this book. Instead, he offers something much more universal. He offers a language that seeks to unite a very polarized community or world. Can we relate to that? Could we all use language? Could we all use some wisdom to unite this very polarized world that we live in right now? I think we could. And then you had the pagan worshipers at the temple. You have the Jewish community. You had brand new followers of Christ called the way. And the followers of the way, where did they come from? Well, they came from there. They were local. They traded in the marketplace. They lived amongst each other. They were the pagan worshipers at the temple of Artemis. They were the Jewish worshipers at the synagogue. Coming together, deciding this is this new faith that we want to follow. This is the way. So you can imagine when two groups like that with totally different backgrounds come together, there's going to be some fights. And Jewish Christians were demanding that Gentile Christians follow their traditions. In order to be accepted into the group, Jewish Christians expected that Gentile Christians would be circumcised. People were either fighting or biting their lips in reticent silence, and just like we find it here, even in Titletown, USA, people were divided. If ever there was a time for a good word, I'm guessing it was then. So enter the letter, known by the biblical scholar N.T. Wright, as a breathtaking view of the entire landscape of the New Testament. This one is worth the read, and I'm going to read it with these slides. Ephesians 2.11, don't forget that you, Gentiles, used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it only affected their body and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship along the, Israel, the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made them. You live in this world without God and without hope, but now you've been united with Christ Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. And he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. 
Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who are far away from him and peace to the Jews who are actually near. Now, all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Can you imagine the change in attitude when these people who are completely divided heard this? Can you imagine the reckoning that they might have been feeling? I can imagine some of them maybe like put their heads down in shame, realizing how much fighting they were doing. When Christ had actually taken those two groups and made them one, he had put to death the division. But we all know that even though Christ put to death the division, it takes our own actions to change that today in many ways. It takes our own ability to say, I am not going to divide anymore. I'm going to find ways to make peace. It's almost like there was a silent reckoning. They realized that they were dehumanizing each other. But I'm sure for many others it took time. And recently, I watched the movie Remember the Titans with my girls. This movie was done about 20 years ago. It's actually from a book and actually a true story that happened in Alexandria, Virginia. That was 1971. I think it's quite amazing that this is Black History Month because we had just studied that. And I realized that just four years ago, I lived 10 miles from Alexandria, Virginia. Um, And that's also 10 miles from the center of Washington, D.C. So at that time, segregation and exclusion was the common. That was it. Up until this point, the high schools had been completely segregated, as you might already know. White students in one school, black students in another. However, the law changed, and it forced this high school, T.C. Williams, to bring them together in one school for the very first time. And if you've seen the movie, you know it caused so much chaos. It became the battleground for racial tension in America. So to appease the black community, they hired a black coach named Herman Boone. They hired him over a Hall of Fame coach. Boone takes the position with hesitation, but without apology in the African-American community, sees him as a hero. The team experiences many highs and lows, and they struggle to learn to accept one another and to play football together to the point where they unify enough to win the state championship. It's an incredibly inspiring story. And we watched it because my girls are homeschooled and we wanted to spend time on the civil rights movement a couple weeks ago. So we watched that movie and we were like, this is just unreal. And what perfect timing because we're very polarized now. There's no way to compare now to the civil rights movement, to the 60s. There's no way to compare that, apples and oranges. But do you know we're divided? You know, and maybe the best thing about it is we're being honest about it now. We're not just pretending. Whether it's refusing to shake someone's hand on national, public, national television or ripping up a piece of paper in the background on national television, we have division. You know, and I'm not here to provide a hot take on either of those things. But all I know is we've got division and everybody's being honest about it. So that might be the first step to finding some sort of peace. I don't know. I hope it is. But when I watched that movie, I learned a few things. First of all, Coach Boone immediately forces these players to get on a bus together, and they weren't supposed to. They didn't want to do it. They did it anyway. Did it change much at the time? You couldn't see it on the surface, but it was starting to change something. The next thing he did is he made all the students get together one-on-one, learn something from the opposite race. That's pretty impressive. They didn't want to do it. They had their notebooks in front of them. They were hesitantly asking questions. And what came out of that and many other experiences is that they learned to understand each other a little better. They learned that they actually weren't as different as they seemed. I heard someone talk about the political spectrum, the political spectrum, any thought spectrum, and you have your right and left. And it seems right now that we are very divided as a country. 
but in reality, we're probably all closer to the center than we realize, but social media and the news has put a magnifying glass on that center. So we see the separation we wouldn't have seen before. It is magnified. And it causes us to really challenge how we are going to live in unity together in this polarized place. If Christ made peace between Jews and Gentiles, two different groups, two different tribes, two different backgrounds, people who don't look, think the same, people who disagree on many things, if he can do that, we can piece this stuff back together through Christ. What a profound truth. Christ's death on the cross transcends ethnicity, gender, You name it, Christ's death on the cross transcends all groups. And if this makes you uncomfortable, it should. The explicit defining act of God's unconditional love through Christ's death on the cross gives us a common new beginning. And that's what Paul was saying. We have a common new beginning. We have a common marker in history we can all remember. And we celebrate it every month here when we take the Lord's Supper together. We remember, we remember that we have a common beginning. So why the walls? Paul said later in Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor there is male or female for you all are one in Christ Jesus. Yeah, so why the walls? What's going on? What's going to break them down? One minute scrolling through Facebook is all you need to know we're polarized. You know that the walls are up, the hostility is there. Even on the news and in the papers. But the question I've been asking myself is how do I take the high road? Do you take the high road? That's a question you have to ask yourself sometimes. I know that when someone goes low... When someone takes the low road with me, I have a tendency to take the low road along with them. You know, I actually don't like, this is kind of sort of a side note, but I told my wife yesterday, I don't like to be a part of private Facebook groups that all agree about something. (laughs) I don't know what that says about me, but I don't know why I'm just like, it's not interesting. Get me in a group where people don't agree with stuff. That's more interesting to me. It might say that I'm a bit of a rabble rouser at times, and I need to figure that out in myself. But what can we do in times where we're sitting in front of somebody else? We know, maybe it's at Thanksgiving, maybe it's going to be at an Easter dinner or something, and we know they're saying stuff that we disagree with wholeheartedly. How do you, to- how do you typically respond? Do you take the low road along with them? Or is there a way that we can do this differently? And one of the things I think about is, am I going to listen to understand or just respond? I typically listen to respond. I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say next to you when you share something with me. But what if we could actually sit down like they did in Remember the Titans with our notebooks and say, I actually want to get to know you. Why do you feel that way? Do we even do that anymore? Are we in a climate where that's just not possible? Sometimes feels that way, but I I can guarantee it's not. We can do this. We can listen to understand. We can give each other their dignity back. We don't have to dehumanize. Our two groups have been made one. And when we are seeking to understand, are we simply reacting to people? Are we letting our frustrations and our fears just seep up to the surface and boom, I am angry? (laughs) Or can we thoughtfully respond to people? Can we connect with people where they are right now? I don't know. It's hard for me. It is so hard for me. This is one of the most challenging things. It's easy though, to only surround ourselves with people we agree with. You know, you kind of hunker down in your echo chambers. It's easy to do that, but it's really hard to get around people who don't think like us, act like us, who don't look like us. But life is inevitably, inevitably filled with that. <laughs> We're constantly with people that don't think like us 
don't look like us, don't come from the same backgrounds. But if we just stay in our caves, we're just going to isolate ourselves and eventually dehumanize the people around us. And it's just another brick in the walls of hostility. But Christ made peace between Jews and Gentiles. 2020 is gearing up to be another year of polarization. We already have six, five weeks or so, six weeks of that. <laughs> you see it all over the place. And no one is pretending to like each other. We can choose to stay silent. We can choose to stay neutral and assume that things are going to get better. Or we can show up. And when we are in those positions where we have the choice to respond or react, are we going to choose to be right or are we going to choose to be light? I've heard that recently and it sounds a little silly, but <laughs> are we going to be light? How we respond and react to people matters. My mom used to always say she was a motivational speaker for a fi Lincoln Financial Corporation. She traveled the United States and she used to always say, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And that's always stuck with me. Now, has it always been how I've responded? Absolutely not. But I do know that because I know it for myself. The people that I respect the most are the people that I know care. So are we going to show up and care? We can seek out people that think differently than us. We can choose to be light. We can choose to passionately humanize people and refuse to go low by excluding people based on how they're not qualified, based on their political affiliation. I know I'm not supposed to talk politics, but that's the division, so I'm okay with it. If it makes us squirm in our seat, good. Let's be honest. <laughs> We're divided. That is not the way of Christ. I thank God for Pilgrim Congregational Church, where I see people who think differently, who have different backgrounds, but are choosing to be family anyway. And I see that happening here all over the place. But we still step out of this place. We still go into the workplace. We still see our families and our friends and our strangers that are around us every day. Listen, I know it's not easy. I don't even do it most of the time, but we can't pretend like division doesn't exist anymore. What if we pursued peace? There's a big difference between keeping peace and making peace. Making peace is not passive. It takes a lot of intentionality and hard work. There's a pastor and author who said, the church is not to be found at the center of the left and right. The church is to be a species of its own, own kind, confounding both left and right and finding its identity from the grounding center of Christ's death on the cross. That's hard. <laughs> center, neutrality, it seems to be the right approach, but it's not. We have to transcend that. We have to transcend that because our grounding doesn't come from the political world or even the theological debates of our time. It comes from the grounding center of Christ's death on the cross that broke down the hostilities that separate us. Amen? Can we please, God, give us the courage to step out, to show up, to keep, to make the peace, to show up and be light in the context of Christ who made one creation from a fragmented people. We are being called to show up. The absence of conflict is not unity. I've been in plenty of situations. I was trying to think of stories to tell of my own life. I was like, ah, this stuff hits too close to home. I can't, I'm not sure I can share some of this stuff yet, but... You know, I've been in plenty of situations where I've realized that the absence of conflict is not unity. Just because I'm staying silent doesn't mean we're unified. Unanimity is not unity either, is it? Just because we all agree, just because we all think the same, that doesn't make unity. Our church, in the congregational way, 
says that we are free thinking and we are welcome to diverse thought. So if that's who we are, we are a body that's full of diversity in thought and backgrounds. And we celebrate that. We welcome that. That's what we want. Bring it on. More of that. Our unity comes when we gather together in one body. One body with a common truth. And I'll read this again from Paul. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups. He did this by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. Let's remember that every day. And let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you have brought two groups together as one. Help us to transcend through your death on the cross all of the division that this world tries to stir up in us because I don't want to live like that. And I thank you for how you are bringing things together. God, give us ways where we can show up, where we can make peace, where we can look someone else in the eye and tell them that they are worth it, that they are loved, that we have a common truth, that we have a marker in history that brings us together. Thank you so much for showing us with your great convincing love through Christ's death on the cross that we could be made one. In your heavenly name, amen.